alcohol. I'm Dr. Chris Masterjohn, I have a PhD in nutritional sciences, and I am here to tell you why the widespread claims in the nutrition and longevity spaces that there is no safe level of alcohol consumption are total nonsense. And what we will see is that alcohol is a macronutrient, it's a source of toxicity, and it is a drug, and all toxins have the potential to have a hormetic effect at low doses, which means that a little bit of something that's bad for you in high doses can be good for you because it generates a fitness response that makes you healthier because you are responding to that stress in a way that it will make you better able to handle it next time. And a great example of this is just to think about exercise. So a little bit of exercise is giving you a stress that you can adapt to by being more fit if you get too much exercise, you're overtraining and you actually drain your fitness. And we'll see that there's good data suggesting that alcohol exactly does this. Now, why is alcohol a macronutrient? Well, what do you do with macronutrients versus what do you do with drugs and toxins? If you have a straight up drug, something that does not belong in the human body, cannot be normally metabolized for energy, or you have a toxin, what you're trying to do is get rid of it. So you metabolize it to the extent that makes it easier to export from the liver into the urine to get it out of your body. That's not what you do with alcohol. What you do with alcohol is the same thing that you do with protein, fat, or carbohydrate. You start ripping it apart. You make NADH. You make acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA goes into the citric acid cycle and generates more NADH, generates some FADH2. These are carriers of energy made from niacin and riboflavin, they bring that to the electron transport chain in the mitochondria and make ATP from it. That's what you do with alcohol, that's what you do with protein, that's what you do with fat, and that's what you do with carbohydrate. Now, alcohol is obviously a drug because it can have drug-like effects on the brain, it calms your inhibitions, it can make you black out, it can make you calmer than you should be, it can have addictive properties in some people, and so on. We know it does that. But that's in addition to the fact that it is ultimately burned for energy. And then it can be a potential source of toxicity because in the course of its metabolism, it generates acetaldehyde, and acetaldehyde can have toxic effects. But guess what? We generate toxic aldehydes from the rest of our food, and there's actually acetaldehyde found in fruits and vegetables. If you look at acetaldehyde levels in people that do not consume any alcohol, they are significant, and they're, then you find acetaldehyde in the average person who's not drinking alcohol. Then when you look at the difference between an alcoholic coming in, to treatment, coming in for treatment versus someone who doesn't drink any alcohol, that gap in acetaldehyde levels is very similar to the concentrations of methylglyoxal, another toxic aldehyde. But methylglyoxal is produced from protein, fat, and carbohydrate. So yes, the toxic aldehydes in your blood, they're always present. They're coming from the normal foods that you eat. If you drink alcohol, you'll have more of it, but you aren't generating unique toxicity from the alcohol. You're just adding to the toxic load of the same types of toxins that you get from the rest of the food that you're eating. Okay, so now, would alcohol have a hormetic benefit? Does it cause a stress that leads to a benefit at low doses? There is experimental evidence for this. There are two main mechanisms that are likely to carry out a hormetic effect from alcohol. Number one is increasing the amount of enzymes needed to detoxify the alcohol. Why? Because detoxing alcohol, or burning it for energy rather, shares enzymes in common with the activation of vitamin A. And when you activate more vitamin A, you get more benefits. One of the Studies from the 1970s on the hormetic benefits of alcohol showed that testosterone increases in rats fed alcohol up to the amount of a couple drinks per day, and then it decreases. You lose the benefit after that, and then too much alcohol will tank the testosterone of rats. That is a hormetic pattern, and it can be explained by improved activation of vitamin A because vitamin A plays a role in the synthesis of sex hormones. We also know that alcohol generates reactive oxygen species in its consumption. Well, guess what? So does exercise. And so the fitness response to exercise shares things in common with low-dose reactive oxygen species from uh, ethanol. And one of the things that we know happens when you generate reactive oxygen species is that you generate improved antioxidant defenses. 
And what we can see from cell experiments, these are experiments, so they're showing cause and effect, is that at a low concentration of alcohol, you get improved superoxide dismutase activity. That's an antioxidant enzyme that protects you from oxidative stress. As you go higher in alcohol concentrations, you start to lose that benefit, and then you trash your antioxidant defenses because you just have too many reactive oxygen species, and you can't handle them. You put too much stress into the system. That, again, is a hormetic benefit. It suggests that there's a benefit of ethanol at low doses. Okay, so what about those doses? In order to try to translate this into human effects, we have to go to the observational literature because we don't have long-term randomized controlled trials of different doses of alcohol compared to one another on key endpoints related to longevity. We're never going to have that. So we have to look at whether the animal and cell experimental evidence lines up with the observational data in humans. Because if it does, we can't prove that there's a cause and effect hormetic relationship, but we can certainly say that it's highly reasonable to think that there is. So what do we see when we look at that data? Well, first of all, in the study widely claimed to show that there's no safe level of alcohol for the brain, going from zero to one alcohol unit, which is half a drink per day, was not associated with any harm in females, and it was associated with slightly better markers of brain volume in males. Second of all, DNA markers of aging go down with increasing number of drinks per week, at least through seven drinks per week, which is one drink per day. Peter Atia at MD recently claimed that a Mendelian randomization study using genes for alcohol use disorder could serve as a proxy for alcohol intake. But the alcohol use disorder is not defined simply by the amount of alcohol consumed. It's defined by failing to meet obligations, being unable to stop drinking, needing to drink in the morning, blacking out frequently, causing physical injury to oneself or others, and behaving in a way that leads others to intervene in your drinking habits. And although it's true that the authors of that study argued correctly that the score in the alcohol use disorder test correlates with the number of drinks per day. That's simply because the number of drinks per day is a variable on the test, but only 16 out of 40 total points in the score relate to how much and how often you consume alcohol. The other 24 points on the score relate to all of the negative behaviors associated with alcohol use disorder and not the amount of alcohol that you're getting. Consumption of low levels of alcohol, which means up to one drink per day, in the broad high-level picture, is associated with a 26% lower risk of heart disease and 24% lower risk of all-cause mortality. So it's hard to reconcile that alcohol use disorder genes are correlated with no safe amount of alcohol for heart disease, and yet actual consumption of alcohol is correlated with a lower risk of heart disease. But this 24% lower risk of all-cause mortality on one drink per day is really important as an observational finding because it suggests that we can synthesize all of the disease substitutions, the things that go up and down. The net effect is you live longer if you are a drinker of one drink per day. It doesn't prove causation, but it, if we have experimental evidence for a hormonic benefit and we see that a low amount like one drink per day is associated with improved all-cause mortality... That's consistent with that hormetic benefit translating into overall net longevity at the level of one drink per day. Now, if we break that down a little bit further, we'll see that one drink per day is associated with decreased risks of all forms of cardiovascular disease, all except four types of cancer, and with diabetes, dementia, Alzheimer's, and chronic kidney disease. But let's look at some of that data in a little bit more detail to try to see where is the exact bottoming out point of each of these different types of disease risks when we look specifically at the correlations with alcohol. Okay, so we will see that for fractures, there's a nuance. So there's a slight increase in risk in total fracture, but osteoporotic fracture bottoms out at one drink per day. What I think is going on there is that at above one drink per day, you are getting an increased risk of total fracture because you are under the influence of alcohol more often, so you're more likely to have an accident. And when you have an accident, you're more likely to have a non-osteoporotic fracture. By contrast, the actual process of deteriorating bone health that is 
to an extent dependent on vitamin A activation because vitamin A is an important nutrient for bones, I think you're getting a hormetic benefit of the alcohol that's reducing the risk of osteoporosis at the level of one drink per day. Glioma bottoms out at one to two drinks per day. Chronic pain bottoms out at one drink per day. Atrial fibrillation doesn't really go anywhere until you get to three, three drinks per day and then it takes off into the moon. Goes, the risk goes up with more drinks per day. Risk of Alzheimer's is lower in any drinkers than non-drinkers and doesn't start rising until above two drinks per day. Parkinson's bottoms out at around two drinks per day. Bladder cancer risk seems to rise at nearly any alcohol intake. But for kidney disease, it looks like the only unsafe amount of alcohol is zero because it starts going down the more you drink until it gets a bottoming out point and then it just stays flat as you continue to drink more. For kidney stones, it even more looks like that picture because up to any measured intake, the more you drink, the less your risk of kidney stones. Even among Asians who have an increased risk of the accumulation of the toxic intermediate in alcohol metabolism, acetaldehyde, diabetes risk bottoms out at one drink per day. But if you look at diabetes more broadly in the general population, it also bottoms out around one drink per day. Prostate cancer bottoms out about one drink per day, although the association is weak. Progression from mild cognitive impairment to dementia bottoms out around one drink per day. Esophageal cancer has a no safe amount of alcohol distribution, meaning it just goes up as you deviate from zero. Although squamous cell carcinoma doesn't really take off until you get to about half a drink per day. For venous thromboembolism, the only unsafe amount of alcohol is zero. Just the more you drink, the less venous thromboembolism you have. Breast cancer risk seems to go up at any dose of alcohol, so there's no safe level for breast cancer. Depression bottoms out at about 0.7 drinks per day. Erectile dysfunction, up to three drinks per day is associated with a lower risk. For risk of community-acquired pneumonia, there may be no safe level of alcohol consumption. Non-melanoma skin cancer follows a no safe amount distribution, though the effect size is weak. For endometrial cancer, the only unsafe level of alcohol is zero. Just the more you, alcohol you consume, the lower your risk, although the association is weak. For thyroid cancer, the only unsafe amount of alcohol is zero. The more you consume, the less thyroid cancer you have. No safe level of alcohol for squamous cell carcinoma, but the effect size is weak. H. pylori bottoms out at one drink per day. Liver cirrhosis has a no safe amount distribution, but the effect doesn't really take off until you hit a few drinks per day. Heart attacks bottom out around two drinks per day. And then finally, total mortality, the, sum, the net sum of all these effects, bottoms out around 0.3 drinks per day, and it stays bottomed out until at least the half a drink per day mark. So in conclusion, the optimal dose of alcohol from the total amount of the data that we have appears to be in the range of 0.3 to 0.5 drinks per day, where the risk of total mortality bottoms out. And while there appears to be a no safe amount of alcohol for esophageal cancer, community-acquired pneumonia, non-melanoma skin cancer, squamous cell carcinoma, and liver cirrhosis, the opposite no unsafe amount of alcohol except zero distribution is found for chronic kidney disease, kidney stones, venous thromboembolism, endometrial cancer, and thyroid cancer. Diabetes, glioma, chronic pain, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, and H. pylori bottom out around one drink per day. Cardiovascular disease bottoms out around two drinks per day. Erectile dysfunction stays lowered up to three drinks per day. And depression bottoms out at 0.7 drinks per day. Now, while these are observational studies and can't demonstrate cause and effect, cell and animal experiments provide reason to believe that alcohol has a hormetic effect at low doses mediated by improved activation of vitamin A and increased defense against reactive oxygen species. A half a drink per day seems to be where the average person's optimal average intake is, given the vast wealth of observational data suggesting total mortality and most disease risks are bottomed out here and suggesting it's safe for the brain volume and beneficial for the progression to dementia. Now, this does not mean that everyone's safe amount is at that threshold. Indeed, alcoholics may be much better off teetotalers and many people may have a higher or lower tolerance and you have to judge this by how you respond to it. This also doesn't say anything specific about the frequency. We know things like the more you drink in one session, the more likely it is to disrupt your sleep. We know that the more you drink in one session, the more likely you are to feel hungover the next day. You can probably think about this as too much stress in the same way that you think about too much stress from overtraining. 
You can certainly train so hard that you feel like crap the next day, and you can make an argument that it might not be great for you. A lot of people find that if they train too much too often, they'll get sick more often, and the same could be true for people who drink too much. So there's definitely something to be said about moderating both the amount that you drink in one session as well as the total exposure, but you probably have to listen to your body to figure out where the optimal amount for you is in the same way that you have to listen to your body to figure out where your threshold for overtraining in one session is. If you train so hard that you get rhabdo, you've clearly exceeded that. And if you drink so hard that you're blacked out and you feel terrible for three days or you crash a car, you drank too much. Now, what you have to do ideally is figure out, okay, what is the long-term effect of drinking three drinks per week all in one session on the weekend versus averaging out that over seven days or over five days, you just need to look at what does that do to your long-term health. It's better to look at over a few months of having one habit, how does that impact my overall sleep, my overall health, my overall energy, my overall libido, my overall work capacity, et cetera. That's better than looking at the acute effect because just because you got hung over once here or you got your sleep disrupted there does not tell you your net adaptation to that. But it's probably the case that if you don't give yourself a hangover and you don't disrupt your sleep, that's probably better for you. That's probably the case. You just need to test it out. Now, what are the variables that are going to cause different responses in different people? Well, we know that NAD plus is needed for alcohol clearance, not only niacin status, but this means that hundreds of mitochondrial disorders could play a role in alcohol tolerance beyond the well-established variation in the acetaldehyde dehydrogenase genes. And I would point out that this is also true of your tolerance for normal foods. I mentioned before that methylglyoxal is generated by protein, fat, and carbohydrate, and this rivals acetaldehyde as a toxin. But it's also the case that there's hundreds of metabolic impairments that can generate neurotoxins and cardiotoxins from dietary protein or fat. For example, if you cannot break lysine down effectively, you will accumulate glutaric acid, which is a demyelinating neurotoxin when you eat protein. I estimate that each person has one to six highly nutritionally actionable genetic mutations that affect whether they metabolize food energy correctly and influence, and that those will in turn influence the generation of toxins from food. And so for more information on that, see how I found my health super unlock after 20 years of research and 20,000 genes tested. See the link in the description for that. And in the meantime, don't drink if you're an alcoholic and otherwise adjust your alcohol consumption to what makes you feel best with half a drink per day, or maybe a little bit under that, which is 15 drinks per month on average, or maybe down to 10 drinks per month, being the starting point for what is most likely to be beneficial. And from there, listen to your own body.